Buenos días, Tijuana. Es un gran placer estar aquí con ustedes. Um, si me permite, voy a presentar en inglés porque así tengo más confianza. Pero, tengo, uh, pero puedo entender sus preguntas después en español. Bueno, empezamos. Uh, shall we start the presentation? Here we go. There we go. Okay. So this first image, um, I, I wanted to begin with a little bit of personal history because my personal history is also the history of Boing Boing and the history of how I began uh, my life in, in media. And, and maybe there's some lessons for you in all of this as well. Uh, the, the photograph that you're looking at was the very first punk rock show that I ever went to. Uh, and I'm in that crowd somewhere. I think that the man who is stage diving might be uh, about to kick me. Uh, this was a lot of fun. This was like back in the 1980s when punk was still a very new thing, a very fresh thing. And it was all about people who were told that they couldn't be musicians. You know, they, they were told that they didn't have the professional training, that they didn't have the right equipment, they didn't have the record label connections. Uh, these people said, we're going to do it ourselves, and this is something that belongs to us. And maybe it won't be perfect, maybe it will be rough, but it is ours. And this was a kind of revolution uh, in, in culture that I think really gave way to the revolution in media that happened a couple of decades later. So. There's that, and you know, along with all of the shows and with all of the bands, we produced a lot of print media. These flyers that you see and uh, the zines that you see in this photo uh, were from the mid 80s. We, we used to go into copy shops and uh, copy these little magazines that we would create. We would take X-Acto knives and, and letter set typography and uh, draw with ink and copy these and share these at the shows. Uh, they were free. Sometimes there might be advertising from uh, like a company that sold combat boots or some cool record label. But this was very much creating culture where culture didn't exist and creating a form of communication that was new. And that was me. <laughs> um, that was me when I was a teenager. I went through a lot of looks. I, I probably had hair every color of the rainbow, and I, uh, I settled down eventually on the, the color that you see me with today. But um, this is Timothy Leary. Timothy Leary uh, had, oh, OK. Uh, some Timothy Leary fans in the house. He had a saying. Uh, find the others. The idea that once you, once you turn on, once you become connected with possibilities, with big ideas, once you feel that excitement, I mean, to be fair, he was also talking about LSD, he was talking about psychedelic drugs, but, but it's a metaphor, right? Once you turn on, the thing that you do is to find the others. And in finding the others, you create community, you create a movement, and you can change the world. And so, I eventually did find the others. Here we go. That on the left is Cory Doctorow, in the middle, David Peskovitz, and on the right, spitting tobacco into a cup in his school lunchroom is Mark Frauenfelder. These are my business partners, and I show you these photos not only for the purpose of embarrassing my colleagues, although uh, honestly that is part of it, but I share these with you because when we were exchanging emails one day and, and showing each other these kind of embarrassing teenage photos from our punk years, the thought hit me, what are the odds? What are the odds that the four of us share this cultural background, that we all went to hardcore and punk shows and that we all um, did the same terrible things to our hair? Uh, th th there's a sort of a cultural, uh, a shared cultural point of reference in this that, uh, that I think is, it's kind of special. On the left, that's our managing editor, Rob. Uh, his eyes are really big because he's taken a lot of ecstasy, and that's in the early 90s. Durante la época rave, se dice. And uh, this is one of our moderators. Uh, he is steampunk Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and uh, I, he, he asked me, please, not to reveal his name because our moderators uh, like to be anonymous so that they can... Uh, moderators, I should explain, are people who... Uh, who, who look at the comments in the 
uh, the threads below each post on Boing Boing on our blog, and they see what people are saying. They, if someone is being abusive or, or you know, using foul language or threatening somebody or just basically being a jerk, they step in. It's like a bouncer at a party. So this is one of our bouncers, you could say. We're all weird. Uh, when we formed as a company, people used to, uh, the, the press in America, when they first started writing about Boing Boing, uh, when we uh, had our first taste at Celebrity, they would call us a band. And uh, I think of all the band photos that we could find, this is the one that, that uh, represents our feelings about ourselves the best. Uh, you know, we, we like to be goofy, we like to have fun, and we also appreciate weird things, both from the past and the future. Uh, I, I think the fact that people talked about us like a band, again, looking back at where we came from, looking back at that sort of garage, DIY, um, making things out of nothing, there's a reason that that thread exists. So Boing Boing actually began as one of those Xeroxed fanzines. It was something that Mark Frauenfelder, the guy that you saw spitting tobacco into a cup as a teenager, he and his wife uh, created this magazine. It was called uh, the, the World's Greatest Neurozine, or it was originally what they called a, a cyberpunk zine. So something out of that punk culture with this emerging interest in technology, not as something that just drives machines, but as something that really drives culture. That's where Boing Boing came from. And you can see on the cover there's some of the same themes that we talk about now on the blog. Cryptography, uh, how to defeat the man. Ah, yeah, and, and even this. Uh, these were fake ads. I mean, to me, when I, when I look at these, it reminds me a lot of ads that we have today on Boing Boing and, and the way that the site is structured. All of this, I think this issue is from 1985. So it shows you how long uh, Boing Boing as a brand has been in existence. We also accepted ads back then, but I have to tell you uh, that our ad rates have increased a little bit. Yeah, this was a promotional flyer that we used to hand out. Well, I wasn't involved with it then, uh, but, but that Mark and his wife Carla handed out at, at punk rock shows or at art shows to tell people about this cool fanzine that they were, that they were putting together in their spare time. You know, and, and remember too, 1985, this is before people were using computers for layout, uh, at least at that level of indie publication. This was, this was all done by hand and pasted together in Xerox. This that you're looking at now is Boing Boing the website in 1998. So the story goes that you know Mark and Carla had been printing this zine for uh, what had been uh, you know more than a decade by that time. Print costs had gone up. It was becoming an expensive hobby for both of them. They were working at Wired Magazine. Chris Anderson, who will be speaking next, uh, the editor-in-chief of Wired Magazine. Uh, a, a lot of us uh, have worked at Wired at one point or another. This was this sort of um, common point that we had in addition to punk rock. You can see that even back in 1998, in the very beginnings of Boing Boing as a web publication, that uh, some of the topics that we were talking about back then, this is an article about trepanation. Uh, I don't know how to translate that into Spanish, but it's basically people who like drilling holes in their head to become enlightened or to become closer to God or to have a, um, a psychedelic experience. Uh, has anybody in here ever had a hole drilled in their head? <laughs> Me neither. Uh, anyway, we still cover the same sorts of things. I think I have to click this twice to make it advance. Here we go, okay. And that's Boing Boing today. So actually, I, I just did the screen grab right before I came on stage. Um, the same sort of goofy and irreverent and curious material uh, that marked Boing Boing as a fanzine back in the 80s. Obviously, we're also uh, on iPad and on iPhones. Uh, and Android, we're developing an app. Just as uh, publication moved from paper to web, now we're trying to find different ways for this thing that I think is more than the web. Um, we would like to see Boing Boing remain relevant and remain 
the same kind of cultural driver even as uh, web browsers and, and sort of getting your media through the computer falls away and media lives on many, many different devices but with the same spirit. And we're sort of thinking about what that means. One thing that we started doing more of just this year uh, in that same spirit of, of advancing, of, of moving, of evolving is creating these things that we call super features. They're designed. They look very much like uh, a glossy magazine layout. Here was one that we did about never before seen images from the uh, NASA Cassini mission. Uh, the Cassini mission, uh, the purpose of the mission was to explore the rings of Saturn. And the, this, this feature w was something that we could never do on the blog, just in a blog post where you have a couple of lines of text and a link and, and maybe you know me or Corey or Mark saying, this is interesting, you should look at these photos, and then maybe there's a tiny little thumbnail. These images are meant to be seen in the largest way possible, and we can play around with design in these features in a way that we can't in that sort of standard boing-boing layout. So, uh, yeah, you, I, I encourage you to, to actually view this one on our site sometime. On the biggest monitor that you can find, there are photos of the, the moons of Saturn and, and the tiny dust and, and the, the giant scope of what's out there in space. It's, it's really breathtaking. Another feature that we, that we did recently that was the kind of thing that I, I don't know if I would have ever been able to do at the big publications where I worked, uh, 30 Days Through Muslim America, these two young men, Bassam uh, Tariq and Aman Ali, two Muslim Americans out of New York, uh, smart, hip, urban guys. One of them works at an ad agency, the other is a stand-up comic. They, uh, during the, the Muslim holy month of Ramadan, they traveled around America and visited one mosque each day in a different American city, and they took photographs. Uh, this is their culture, this is, uh, this is their people, and in America, as I'm sure you're all very well aware, there's tremendous uh, racism and objectification of, of Muslim Americans. They're seen, um, th there's this idea that like they're all terrorists, and, and just through, I mean, even th th this one photo to me kind of says it all. This is an elder uh, in, in one of the mosques who is, trying to gobble up the last of his meal before prayers begin. The call to prayer has just begun, and uh, he's, he's giving the photographer a little bit of a curious and annoyed look because he'd like to finish his salad. Um, these, these sort of homemade uh, stories, I, I think sometimes, it, it's almost like they're, they're family photo albums from people who uh, are different than you and different than I. And through that kind of natural homegrown media, we understand parts of the world that might be exotic or strange or, or, or terrifying or, 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 or whatever, but just foreign. And they become local, they become familiar, they become comfortable in new ways. Uh, 